Good morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome to the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church. Truly good to see each of you this morning. Dan and Adita, special welcome to you. Good to see you. You haven't been here for a while, but it's a joy to see you guys here today. Special welcome to uh, Pastor Conrad Vine, President of uh, Adventist Frontier Mission. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, to be with us. It's always a privilege and blessing to have you with us and uh, to hear from your experiences, your knowledge, and your understanding of the Word of God. So thank you. I would encourage everyone to mark your calendars as um, Pastor Vine will be back with us on January 30th. That's just three short weeks away. He'll be speaking on an increasingly relevant topic, religious liberty. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. Virtual fellowship will take place shortly after our service, approximately 1230. This is one way to stay connected with your church family. You can find the link in your e-minder and pass it on. I'm sure I don't need to spell out the importance of staying connected as uh, this is a, and this is a great way to do it. Also this afternoon, drive through giving, tithe and uh, offering collection will take place in the church parking lot between 1 and 3 p.m. drive through giving is an opportunity to pick up your first quarter Sabbath school study guide and children division uh, materials as well. Another event you will surely not want to miss is coming up between January 20th our, uh, and 29th. Our church um, prayer ministries team will be leading us in 10 days of prayer. Again, that's Wednesday, January 20th, continuing through the 29th. This year's theme is Seeking Revival, and we look forward to in-person and online presentations each night at 7 p.m. Stay tuned to your e-minder and our church Facebook page for additional information as the date approaches. I would encourage everyone to participate as we seek the Lord and a genuine spiritual experience as we begin the new year. And as we begin our worship this morning, it's my prayer that each one will sense the sweet, joyful presence of our Lord as our hearts go out in thanksgiving and praise to him. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here with one reason, and that is to give you glory and to praise because you are worth it, Lord. As we are going through the difficulties, whether it is personal, what we are seeing in our nations, or whatever it is, we are here, Lord, to stick together and to show truly what your character is. And I pray, Lord, that that would be reflected today in this worship service, that everything will be to the glory of your name and for salvation of all of us. I pray this in the name of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Let us sing hymn opening hymn 304, Faith of Our Fathers. All the words are going to be on the screen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our offering for today, it has to tell us the story about a city or a town, I will say, in Alaska. How many of you have been in Alaska? Good for you. I wish I could go, and I, I hope one day I will go. But I don't know if you know this city is, or the town. It's called Nome, I think so. This, that's the way they pronounce. And um, do you know that the, the Iditaro race is very famous like, with a lot of dogs, and it's very, very nice. I saw several times that one. And it's a one mile, I mean 100 mile trek. So you know dogs like to run, and especially those huskies, they are beautiful when they are running, but I can imagine it's very exhausted. Well, this one, in 1925, the town of Nomi had an outbreak of diphtheria. And that one of the, the really heavy time for the, the, the town. And the quickest way to get to those people, to that population, with some kind of uh, help was with the dogs. So they were planning to have uh, 20 mushers volunteer with over 100 dogs to pull their slide. So they created a relay known of the Great Race of Mercy. That was the, the race that they created and began in January 27. And if the medicine didn't arrive on time over there, uh, many people would perish. And so they rely actually on the dogs and those musher who pulled those dogs as much that they could. But you know, sometimes we have different situations in, in different places. And on February 2nd, at 5.30 a.m., the final leg of the relay arrived in Nome with the dog Balto leading the sled. Today, a statue of Balto is in Central Park in New York. I don't know if you have been in New York and if you have seen in the park. Um, I remember I saw a statue, but I didn't know about the story, so I didn't do the relation. Now I click to my mind why the, dog, the statue of dog was there. It is interesting. Um, there is a toxin of sin that causes all kind of situation in life of people, in humankind, to perish. But we have the antitoxin, and what is that? Any idea what could be the antitoxin for the problem of sin, the, the situation that we have? And we know is to know Jesus and to get him to, to get to him. But in that case, you don't need a 100 dog to bring that to you because it's very easy to find. It's just to kneel in the place that you are or at your, in your uh, quiet area at your home or in your office if you are still working or in your um, close to your bed, in any place that you are, even if you are walking on the park and you want to get in contact with the Lord, you can do it. And that you don't need 100 dogs or, or 20 mushers to pull something to you because it's just right there. It's just close to you. So it's just to close our eyes and kneel. And if you cannot kneel, you still can sit or you still can be up, but you still can get to the Lord to ask for those healings that is miracle for us because that is what the Lord says. And 1 John 5, 4 says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, if even our faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity this day to be here to worship you, to honor you, and to give thanks for all the blessings that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for all the brothers and sisters who came today. Thank you for because you have protected them, you are between them and with their families. We pray for those one who couldn't come, 
that you will be with them too, and the, those who are watching online, be with them too, Lord, that they can, uh, in the spirit, be with us at the same time. We pray for this offering, for the tithe, that it will be multiplied for help those people who still don't know you. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is found in Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served Baals and Asherahs. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He's, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishatim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishatim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishatim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishatim, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, son of Canaz, died. Heavenly Father who are in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be here today. Thank you, Lord, because you have been with us in the week that we passed, that we are finished today. And we have the time to rest, to talk with you, to be in communion with you. Thank you, Lord, for that, for this day, because we can rest we can read about you, we can talk about you, and we can thought about you. Lord, we are bring today several of our members who are suffering some this situation, health situation. We are praying, Lord, for Jennifer, who had surgery recently, 
we pray that you will be with her, Lord, that she could have a quick recovery and in good recovery, that the pain will be away, and that she could come back, Lord, to us soon. We are praying to Lord for uh, Linda, that we know that she is in uh, rehab now. We are give so much thankful for because you have been with her all the time. We are praying, Lord, for Harold, for Lois, and for many other brothers and sisters. We probably don't know that they are sick. We put their name, your, and their soul in your hands because we know that we just can trust in you because we know you gave us the doctor. You gave people wisdom and technology, and we can trust in them, Lord, because you put them in our path. Lord, we can ask for many things, but at this moment, we are asking that you open our hearts and our mind to understand your will for us. Lord, I'm praying for Pastor Conrad. Be with him, Lord, that his work will come on time for us to listen to your word. Be with him and with his family. The same with Pastor John and his family. And for every member of this family that is your church. Lord, we ask at the same time for forgiveness for our wrongdoings in every time through our words, through our thoughts, through our actions. Lord, we ask for forgiveness and clean, cleanse it and that you can put our hearts in the position that we, you want us to be. Help us to be good to one another, to be humble, to be respectful, to be tolerant. At this moment, moment, Lord, the world is living. Tolerance is one thing that is practically forget, forget for a lot of people. Lord, we can ask many things. And you know the desire of our hearts, the goal that we have in our life. And I'm pretty sure that each brother and sister over here are praying in silence to you at this moment for whatever reason that they have to ask you or give thanks for you to you. Thank you, Lord, for all the, your blessings, your mercies, because it's amazing how much you love us. Thank you, Lord, for everything. We pray all of this when in Jesus' name. Amen. It is my great privilege to welcome all of you, even all, all of you have been welcomed by Elder Doug and all the others. Uh, you heard in a prayer of Sister Sylvia about Sister Jennifer. Uh, she was on a surgery and she's recovering. It's not going to be speedy recovery, so it's going to be recovery for some time. So if any of you of our Elmhurst members would like to help her in any way or give her a call or text, to, text her, please do so. Our dear sister Linda, you also heard in a prayer, she's recovering. She is a miracle story, and uh, she just texted me this morning, and I'm going to read to you. She said, we are making progress and getting stronger every day. Have a target day of the 20th of January to go home, but they say it could be sooner. Uh, Stan, which is our elder of our church, her husband, he comes to the window every day. It's great to see him. 
So they discovered that he can come through the window. So it's beautiful after so many days that they can see each other. So continue to lift her in prayers. Also, there are some of our members who are affected affected with sickness. Uh, I didn't ask permission for their names, so please continue to pray for all of our members who are affected. Uh, now, uh, we are going to have Sister Rasenetta Schwartz, who is going to lead us and prepare our cards for the message today. Uh, but before she plays the piece on piano, I would like to introduce Dr. Conrad Wein, Pastor Conrad Wein. Uh, some of you, they know him already. Some of you, they don't. Also, for our larger audience online, I would like to introduce him. Uh, we are so glad that he is with us. I just need to tell you that he's going to be here on the 30th of this month, January 30th. There are going to be two presentations about religious liberty. Extremely important subject. So he's going to be speaking in the morning at 9.40 and then at 11 o'clock. Both presentations are going to be live streamed. So if you miss one, you can watch after or you can watch the first one and then uh, he's going to finish about 10.30. Then you can still come here to worship together at 11 o'clock. So... Uh, uh, Pastor Conrad Vine, he was born and raised in United Kingdom to the pastoral family. And uh, he grew up with his twin brother and two sisters. And uh, as you know, you don't have your permanent home. You move from one place to another. Uh, then he decided that he would get a degree in business management, which led him to, to work in a healthcare system before in the United Kingdom, before God called him to work for our Seventh-day Adventist humanitarian organization, ADRA. And first, he was called to serve in Azerbaijan. And then after that, he was serving worldwide. Then later on, he decided to go into pastoral ministry. And uh, after that, he worked in London. And then he was called to Minnesota to serve in Minnesota. He served there for four years. And then God called him to serve as a president for Adventist Frontier Mission. This, I hope that all of us know, we as Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are involved. We actually have at least one. Some people are sponsoring some others. But we have as a church one missionary in the country of Georgia, not Georgia in the United States, that we are sponsoring who is working there. And we, from time to time, we are giving you a report about that. Let me just tell you, I'm so glad that, uh, that he's today with us, uh, uh, Pastor Mine. Let me just tell you in his own words what is in his heart. And I'm quoting him. Let's life experiences have brought tears of both joy and sorrow. But a potter, which is our Jesus Christ, continues to shape me for his purposes. My dream is that people of every nation, tribe, people, and tongue will be saved, and my joy every day is to see the Holy Spirit at work, drawing people from around the world into God's kingdom. What a privilege, what a joy. Amen. And praise God for that. So before he's going to... Oh, I forgot one thing. He's married. His wife's name is Luda. She's not here with us, with him. And he have his boy, David, and his girl, Christina, also. But before he's going to be speaking, Sister Rasenetta will prepare our heart for the message. <laughs>
Uh, thank you very much, Sister Hasneta. I think uh, music reaches parts of the soul that words cannot. And I thank God for the gift of music. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pastor John, for such a warm and gracious welcome. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be with you here today to share the Sabbath with everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all here today on a very crisp uh, winter Sabbath morning. And um, I pray that uh, as we talk about the Word of God today, that the Spirit of God will shine into our hearts just as the sun is shining outside. I bring greetings from my wife, as uh, Pastor John said. Um, I'm the husband of one wife, and um, she's back in Berrien Springs. Uh, that means only one mother-in-law, as you know. That's good news. And so uh, they're back in Berrien Springs with our children. We've been celebrating Christmas together and New Year. And uh, next week, my son goes back to Southern because uh, the family disperses once again. But it's been a pleasure and a privilege to share uh, the Christmas season together as a family. And it's a privilege to stand before you here this morning and to share from the Word of God. Our sermon today is entitled, What One Person Can Do. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, <clears throat> it's not the kind of sermon that's going to get you cancelled. The sermons I preach in three weeks may get me cancelled, but this sermon's not going to get me cancelled as far as I know. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the first of the judges, and his name was Othniel. And so let's bow our heads and we invite, invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of serving you and sharing here this morning with uh, this, your church. I ask, Father, that the chaos of the world outside will fade away, and uh, we will um, focus once again on your word and your truth and you will guide us as to how we are to live through this coming week. I thank you, Father, for the promise of your spirit. I pray that you will guide what I, spit, what I say, you will speak through me, and that the words I speak will bring comfort and hope and a joy to those who are here. Father, we pray for those who are watching online, uh, scattered around Chicago, Illinois, and uh, the United States. We pray a blessing upon them that the internet will hold up, and that they may also experience the presence of your Holy Spirit today. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. And so today uh, we're living in a country where, despite the events of the last week, as a more general rule, we're living in a culture that is increasingly hostile towards Jesus Christ. We're living in a society that, where we have rampant individualism, a society where greed and narcissism and self-promotion are rampant, We're living in a society where um, wrong is right and right is wrong. We're living in a society where what you thought was normal today is hate speech tomorrow, and what becomes hate speech yesterday will be normal in three weeks' time. We're living in a world of moral chaos. We're living in a world where every man does what is right in his own eyes, and nobody can tell anybody else what is right or what is wrong, what to do or what not to do, because that makes you an oppressor. And so this is the society in which we are now living. And we ask ourselves, how do we respond to this world in which we now find ourselves? How do we respond as children of God? How do we respond not just as citizens of the United States, but as citizens of God's kingdom? And we're gathered here today presumably because we are first and foremost citizens of God's kingdom from where we are expecting our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so how we live in this next week it does not really depend on our nationality or the passports we hold. It depends on our allegiance to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're gathering here today not so much that we may indulge in politics, which we're not going to do, but to ask ourselves, what would God have me do in this coming week? And so the Bible talks about a time very similar to the world in which we live today, when God's people lived in the midst of a hostile and pagan civilization, where God's people were facing temptation to compromise on every side, where God's people were actually divided among themselves, as are many churches today, a time in which there was no central authority or no respect for any central authority, a time when, as the book of Judges says in chapter 21, in those days there was no king in Israel, Every man or woman did what was right in their own eyes. We are living in times like that today. But this is not the first time such chaos has affected a nation. It's happened in the past, and God's people have lived through those times, and they've survived through those times, as may we here today in the United States. We're going to turn our our focus today to the book of Judges. We're going to look at the first of the Judges. His name was Othniel. Um, when I was a young boy, I used to love reading through the book of Judges through my father's sermons. 
And why was that? Because my father would give these heavy theological sermons, and we had no TV or anything at home. The most violent thing we ever saw was Tom and Jerry. Remember Tom and Jerry? And, uh, you know, my brother liked Tom and I liked Jerry, and as their battles went, so went our battles. You know, my twin brother, he sometimes preaches here as well. And uh, so I would read the book of Judges through my father's sermons, because this was the closest I could get to X-rated. There was a lot there for the young male mind to feast on during my father's sermons, but not so much during the first of the judges, and his name was Othniel. As you go through the book of Judges, you see that Israel gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and you find that the character of the judges goes from crystal clear, like Othniel, who we'll focus on today, it gets worse and worse and worse. The character of the judges becomes more ambiguous, till eventually we come to Samson, the last of the judges, who fell for every woman he saw, couldn't, couldn't hold himself back from drink. He prayed three times to God and three times asked to be killed by God, hardly a man of faith, and his death came about through his own suicide. And he was the hero of Israel. And so as you go through the judges, the judges get worse just as Israel gets worse. But today we focus on the first of the judges, and his name was Othniel. The, judges, the book of Judges covers the span from, uh, first you have Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses was God's spokesman. Uh, then they were led by Joshua in the conquest. He was God's general. Then you have a period of about 350 years, and then you come to Samuel. And Samuel leads us to Saul and the monarchy. And so for 350 years, you had a nation without a visible central authority. Now, we think the last week has been bad. Can you imagine living in a society without a central authority for 350 years? But God's people still survived, as may we today. Because God is always on his throne, and he always leads his people. It is not a time to throw in the towel or give up hope, because God is still on his throne. And during these 350 years, we know of one prophet, her name was Deborah, and there are a number of, pro of judges that we find in the book of Judges. Some of them we know a lot about, such as Gideon, you know, Gideon's 300. And we know about Jephthah and, uh, and his son, uh, his daughter, for instance, who we think he, he executed on his return from victory in the battle, a tragic story. We know about Samson, but there are some other judges there, like Shamgar and Elon and Tola and Jair, about whom we know almost nothing other than they led Israel for many years, and during the leadership of those judges, things seemed to go okay. And Israel went through this, this cycle, and that first of all, they, they'd be right with God, and then there would be um, apostasy, and then they would fall into the hands of their enemies, and God, then they would turn back to God, repentance, and God would raise a judge, a deliverer, to set things right. And during the lifetime of that judge, things would be okay again. And when the judge died, then the whole cycle started again. But with every cycle, it got worse and worse and worse. So they apostatized, they fell under God's judgment, they repented, and then God raised the judge and he would lead them back to God. And this cycle gets worse and worse. The people are sinking lower and lower and lower with each one of these cycles. And God's people were not faithful when they entered the promised land. They entered a land of incredible wealth. Now imagine um, if you were the people of Israel, you've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. That's like being in Death Valley for 40 years. If you've ever been to the wilderness of Sinai, there's nothing there. It's like camping in the badlands of South Dakota, surrounded by poisonous or venomous snakes and nothing else. No air conditioning, nothing. I mean, that's one of the essentials of life, yes? Internet and air conditioning. So... They're camping in the, in the badlands of South Dakota or Death Valley. And then they're suddenly transported to Malibu or Hawaii. That's what it's like to cross the River Jordan. They're going from 40 years of eating nothing but manna every day. I don't know how you feel about having the same food every day. All right? Uh, if my wife ever goes away from home, she graciously prepares these like things of food in the fridge. And when she comes back, it's always still there because I just revert to bread and cheese, or bread and peanut butter. That's all I eat when my wife is not at home, and I'm quite happy when I'm on my own just eating bread and cheese. But when my wife's around, I'd rather have some variety on a daily basis. I'm a hypocrite, I guess, in that sense. But the Israelites have eaten nothing but manna for 40 years. How would you feel if you ate nothing but manna for 40 years? Tasty though manna is, and there's only so many ways you can prepare manna. You know, my wife said, what would you like for Christmas meal? I said, I'd like baked potato, roast potato, mashed potato, and French fries. <laughs> Chips, potato in any form is always good, yes? Some people come from rice cultures. I come from a potato and, you know, and steamed veg 
uh, very boring diet we have in England. And so potato in any form is good as far as I'm concerned. But I'm not sure how many ways you can prepare manna. But the Israelites come from manna for 40 years to a land flowing with milk and honey. There was olive trees. There were the grains, barley and wheat. Um, there was uh, milk and there was cream. And there was honey. This was a land of plenty. It was like going from, from you know, uh, almost just eating like dry bread to walking to a Walmart. You know, I, I, when I came back for the first time from the Soviet Union, um, things had changed. And I came back to, America, to England, and our local store had turned into a supermarket. And I walked into the, the, um, the section where they were selling um, cereals. And I was astonished. Like, how many cereals do we now have in England? Like in America, yes? You walk into the cereal section, there must be 100 different kinds of cereal there. I mean, it's overwhelming, the choice. And some people come from countries, and they look at this, and it actually overwhelms them. There is so much choice here. How do we navigate all of these choices? And so the people of Israel, they come from, from manna to incredible abundance of food, from the badlands of South Dakota to Malibu, and they walk into the promised land, and instead of seeing people living in tents, they're seeing people living in cities. They are, they have a, they are an advanced civilization. They have iron Chariots, they can, they can smelt iron. They know how to process uh, metals. Um, they, they have music. They're at the center of the Middle East, so all the trading of the Middle East goes through modern-day Israel or the ancient land of Canaan there. And so this was a rich, advanced civilization. And these, um, these tent dwellers from the wilderness, they, they march across the Jordan into the land of plenty. And they must have thought to themselves, why would we kill the golden goose? We've just come from nothingness to where everything is available. These guys must know something about how to live. Their gods must be powerful. They must have some wisdom in the ways of this world. Because Jehovah asks us to live for 40 years in the wilderness on manna in, in goatskin tents, and now we're moving into these beautiful cities with wells that we never dug, we never, uh, dug drinking uh, grape juice from vineyards we never planted, harvesting the barley and the wheat and getting the, the, the uh, fish from the River Jordan and from the Mediterranean. And now they have iron and they have um, other metals and they have beautiful metal works. These guys must be doing something right. The gods of Canaan must be pretty powerful. And so the people of Israel, naturally, almost humanly speaking, they turn their back on Jehovah and they start following the gods of the nation in which they live. It's a cruel nation. It's a nation where the people are always fighting amongst each other. It's a nation of sensual religion and sexual immorality, a nation of no moral restraint, a nation where they would sacrifice their children, they'd roast them alive in the, gods, in the bronze arms of their gods. They were a cruel nation. And this is where the people of Israel find themselves. So turn in your Bible to Judges chapter one. We're gonna be focusing on Judges chapter one today. And we're going to look at verses, the first three verses, Judges chapter 1, the first three verses, and thank you for putting this up on the screen. <clears throat> it says, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up, indeed I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. So Joshua is now dead, and while the initial conquest is complete, some of the tribes have yet to receive their inheritance. And in the map of Israel, if you know where Jerusalem is, Judah, their territory was south of Jerusalem. Benjamin was around Jerusalem, but Judah was the southern part of Israel. It was a large tribe, and the, this, the, uh, the tribe of Simeon, their inheritance was kind of intermingled with the tribe of Judah. They didn't have like separate territories. Judah was the southern half of Israel, south of Jerusalem, and Simeon is intermingled with them. And so it's hard for Simeon to conquer their own territory without the assistance of Judah, and Judah asks the tribe of, Judah, of Simeon, would you please help us to conquer the territory? There are some lessons we can learn from this. One is... Um, the, the, tri the tribe of Judah did not uh, need to ask God, should we go up and conquer? Why? Because God had already commanded them in the start of the conquest to take over the land. They already had a revelation from God. With Joshua, they'd already carved out the land with Urim and the Thummim and the casting of lots. They already knew what God's will was. And so we need to be careful when we're making a decision or saying, is this something that God wants of me? There are many people today who say, well, I will do something if God reveals it to me. When God has often revealed to us enough in Scripture to know what the answer should be. 
You know, sometimes we struggle with sin in this way. We, we may say, well, um, my conscience is troubling me, but I'll wait until I find a verse that specifically condemns this. And of course, there's no such verse. And so we, we use this as an excuse not to turn away from sin sometimes. Sometimes we know what is right, but we don't want to act upon it because we can't find a verse in Scripture that explicitly tells us about it. So I was chatting with someone the other day, and he said, where in the Bible does it say we can't buy Taco Bell on Sabbath? I said, well, there is no verse in the Bible that says do not buy from Taco Bell on Sabbath. Therefore, said my friend, I can go and buy some Taco Bell Sabbath afternoon. I said, well, no, no, you can't do that. Well, why can't I do that? Well, there are some principles in the Bible that you need to look at, and when you apply those principles, it'll give you the answer. So the lesson here is you don't need a specific revelation every time you need a decision. The Bible talks about principles of godly living, and it's up to us to mine the scriptures to know those principles that we may apply them when those questions arise in life. And secondly, Judah asked Simeon to go up with them. That is, we can use our sanctified common sense. When God has given us general principles, he does give us a sanctified common sense to figure out what is the best thing to do here. And so they, they go to battle. We pick it up in verse 4. If you can put that up on the screen there, brother, as well. It says, Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Adonai Bezek means the Lord of Bezek. And they fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And uh, we continue reading uh, on, on the passage there. Uh, in, in this, Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. In ancient times, if you wanted to cripple someone to make sure they could never fight against you, chop off the thumb. Why would you chop off the thumb? Because if you've lost your opposing digit, you can't hold a spear or a sword. You're useless in battle. You can hold an agricultural implement, but you can't strike somebody without, without a thumb. And so by cutting off the thumbs, they're saying you can, you can no longer fight. By chopping off the big toe, it means you can no longer run. It's very hard to run without a big toe. Your big toe is essential for the running motion. And so by chopping off the big thumbs, by chopping off the, tho the toes, it's kind of interesting, boys, isn't it? Yes? Yeah, don't try it at home, right? It's, by chopping off the big thumb, by chopping off the big toe, you're taking people out of battle, and you're basically forcing them to become agricultural laborers. They're no longer a threat to you. And Adonai Bezek, he's a pagan king, and what he says, I did this to 70 other kings, and God has now repaid me. What does this tell us? That Adonai Bezek, he knew his practice of hurting others and deforming his, the kings whom he captured was a crime against humanity and was a crime against God, but he had not repented of that practice. Better for us today, when we know in our hearts that something's not in harmony with God's will, it is better for us that we repent and turn away from it while we live in our own time of probation before we experience God's judgment upon our own sinful practices. Adonai Bezek knew it was wrong, but he kept doing it to those 70 kings. And if there is something in your heart and life today or in your house or home or hearth that you know is not in harmony with God's will, don't wait for catastrophe to strike. If the Holy Spirit prompts you to say, this needs to change, then change while you have grace and mercy and bring your life into harmony with the will of God. So they continue with their conquest. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. The descendant of Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms, that's Jericho, into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near the Arad. There they went and settled with the Amalekites. And he goes on to say that they, they, they slaughtered some Canaanites and devoted it to destruction, etc., etc. All well and good. And things seem to be going well within the story, but then things go badly wrong for the people of Israel. And what starts to go wrong? Well, it starts to go wrong in verse 22. And if you can pull up verse 22 through 25, we'll see what goes wrong with the conquest. It says, the house of Joseph, that's the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, they went up against Bethel. Their territory is just north of Jerusalem in what we now consider the West Bank. And, they, and the Lord was with them. And uh, I pick it up here. The Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, sent out spies to Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. When the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. 
So he showed them the way into the city, and they put the city to the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. Now, what is wrong with this? I mean, they sent out spies. Didn't Joshua send out spies to Jericho? Yes. Did God bless that? Yes. Did they spy out the land? Yes. Did Moses send spies into the promised land? Yes, he did. It seems that sending out spies was a normal practice for Moses and Joshua. So now the Israelites, the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, they do it as well. But this is where the problems start because it says upon the text, um, so he da da da, and the man, okay, can you drop back a verse there um, to verse uh, 24? I'm sure I don't see it on the screen there. Yes, and we will show you mercy. Yeah, please show us the entrance to the city and we will show you mercy. My version says, show us the way into the city and we will deal kindly with you. And that word kindly is the word from where we get the word a covenant. That is, we're going to make a deal with you. You show us how to get into the city, we'll kill everybody in the city, but we'll let you go. This is an alliance of convenience with a pagan with, a, with, a, with an idol worshiper. And this is something that God has explicitly said you are not to do. You are not to enter into alliances of convenience with those who are antithetically opposed to God. In Judges chapter two, um, where, where Jesus appears to them, the angel of the Lord there in Judges chapter two, says the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I promised to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and for your part, do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land, tear down their altars. So God says to Israel, I've made an everlasting covenant with you. If you'll be my people, I will be your God. And I'm not going to break that covenant. But you have broken the covenant because you have entered into a covenant with some of the people of this land. And then he says to them, tear down their altars. See, the apostle Paul says when the pagans bow down to their idols, they're bowing down to demons. 1 Corinthians 10. This is spiritual adultery that the Israelites are committing. The worship of these demons, if you worship demons, you become like demons. Just as if you worship Jesus, you become like Jesus. By beholding, you become changed. So as you worship demons, your character is changed into a demonic character. I think we're seeing some of that in our country today. We're seeing, well, demonic manifestations around our nation today as people worship things other than Jehovah God. Do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. That is... There can be no agreement between Satan and Christ, so why would his people seek to make alliances of convenience with those who are antithetically opposed to God? And this is the start of their problems, because if you look through the rest of this chapter from verse 27 to verse 36, you see that there is a steady descent on the part of the Israelites. What happens? Firstly, when the Israelites obeyed God, they destroyed their enemies. But when they started to enter into convenient alliances of convenience, then they started to allow the Canaanites to live at some distance from them. And then they started to allow the Canaanites to live among them. And then the Canaanites started to allow the Israelites to live among them. And then the Canaanites started determining where the Israelites were going to live. Do you follow the progression? It gets worse and worse. At first, the Israelites say, you go and you leave the land. Then the Israelites say, you can go and live over there. Then the Israelites say, you can come and live among us. And then the people, the Canaanites say to the Israelites, actually, you can live among us. And then the Canaanites said, well, actually, you need to go and live over there, and you can't come and live where we are. It gets, the, the progression gets worse as you go through the chapter. Just follow the details. That is the descent of God's people. Once they start entering into agreements, alliances, um, partnerships with those who have nothing to do with the kingdom of God, things do not go right. If you are wearing a clean suit and you, you dance with somebody wearing a dirty dress, are you going to get dirty or is she going to get clean? Just ask yourself. All right? It's a hypothetical question, all right? But you know that if you are clean and somebody is dirty, and let's say you have a clean hand and they have a dirty hand and you, and you shake hands, is their hand going to be cleaner because you've got a clean hand? No. Your hand will become dirty because their dirt will always transmit. And so this is what happens to God's people within this chapter. And uh, if you turn to Psalm 106, keep your fingers in Judges 1 there. In Psalm 106, you see what God, God's judgment on Israel is during this time. And it's not a very uh, pleasant judgment that we read. Psalm 106, verses 34 through 35. This is talking about the Israelites. Psalm 106, verse 34. And um, we see it there. They did not destroy the peoples. This is God's 
evaluation of the people when they entered the promised land. They did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and they learnt their works. That is, they learnt their works. They started thinking about their works. They started taking it to heart. Maybe this is how we should live. After all, we've lived on manor in tents for 40 years and these people have everything in luxurious cities. They must know something about life, yes? They've learnt their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. And so you see, this is God's evaluation of what happened to the children of Israel as they entered into the promised land. Not only were they turning their back on God, but they were starting to adopt the ways and the mannerisms of the nation in which they live. And there is always a tension for Christians to live for the kingdom of God. And how do you live in a nation that is turning its back on God while God is calling you to a high standard? How can you authentically live the Christian faith in a society that is hostile to Christianity, that says we will not have this man to rule over us? You know in the parable of the talents, I'm kind of going off off base here, in the parable of the talents in Luke 19, Jesus bases it on the story of King Archelaus. When King Herod died, King Herod died, who tried to kill Jesus at birth, Archelaus wanted to be king. So he went to Rome to ask Caesar if he could be the king of, of, of Judea. And because Archelaus was a cruel prince, the people of Israel sent a delegation after him to see the Caesar and said, we do not want this man to rule over us. It was a well-known historical event. And in the parable of the, the master, he, he gives her his three servants, ten talents, uh, five talents, two talents, and one talent. Do you remember the story? And he says, occupy till I come. And then he goes off to the foreign land to get royal authority. But while the master is away, nobody knows who's going to return because the people of the land in the parable send a message after him saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. You're familiar with that parable, yes? And so what does the smart money do? You see, in a world that says we will not have this man to rule over us, the smart money is the buried money. It's hedging its bets. Nobody knows who's going to return with royal authority, the master who went away or somebody else. So the smart money is the buried money. You're hedging your bets. You're staying silent on social media. You, you're quiet into conversations with work colleagues because you're not sure what they think about spiritual matters. But when the master comes back and the servant has turned five into ten talents, the master does not say, well done, good and profitable servant. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. The master com- commends his faithfulness to work for the master when the master is away, never knowing whether the master really will return. That's what he commends, not his profitability. He commends his faithfulness in in using the talents in a way that brings honor and glory to the master who is to return in a society that says, we will not have this man rule over us. That is what we find in the parable of Jesus. And I really can't remember how I got onto that, but we're going to come back to the sermon, all right? So we're going to turn then to the first of the judges. Othniel, Judges chapter 1. We come across him in verse 11. This isn't where he acts as a judge, but this is where he appears for the first time. Judges 1, verse 11, it says, From there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. Then Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer and takes it, I will give him my daughter Aksa as wife. And Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. And he gave him his daughter Aksa as wife. And when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. As she dismounted from her donkey, Caleb said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Give me a present. Since you have set me in the land of the Negev, give me also Guloth Mayim. So Caleb gave her the upper Guloth and lower Guloth. And uh, Guloth Mayim means basins of water. And so what can we know about uh, Othniel here? Well, his uncle was a guy called Caleb. Caleb was one of the 12 spies that went into Israel. Of the 12 spies, how many were faithful? Two, Joshua and Caleb. And when they entered the promised land, how old was Caleb when he entered the promised land? He was 85. We know about that in the book of Joshua. And when he comes into the promised land, he says to Joshua, God promised that I would enter the promised land 40 years ago, before we started the wanderings in the wilderness. For 40 years I've wandered in the wilderness, but I've trusted in the promises of God that one day before I die, I will enter the promised land. And now we're here, says Caleb, at the age of 85. He says, my strength is as strong today for going out to war and for coming in as it was when I was a young man. Let me go and take the city that God promised me a city of giants, and he goes and takes it. And Othniel is his nephew. Othniel has been wandering in the wilderness for years as well. Othniel knows the family story. He knows that of the entire generation that left Egypt, only two men crossed the Jordan, Joshua 
and Caleb. He's seen that God's promises come true in his family. Do you not think that Caleb spoke about this in the wilderness? Don't worry, guys. I'm not going to die yet. You know, I may have a heart attack. Don't worry, I'm not in the promised land yet. I'm not going to die today. He could trust God's promises. He did trust God's promises. And Caleb was, Othniel was raised in a family that knew that God had made promises to them and was acting upon those promises and saw God's promises come true. Now, some of us here have got, you know, uh, you know um, uh, hair like mine, yes? Gray, yes, we kind of, we, you know, there comes a time in life by the age of 16 when you start to go gray. When you, and uh, I was going gray at 16. It wasn't a good time, but I was going gray at 16. And uh, when you get gray hair, you think, oh, what can I do for God? But when you're a retiree, you say, what can I do for God? Well, there's a whole family. We all have families. We have generations after us when we have gray hair, and they need to hear from us what God has done for us. They need, they need to hear us to testify to God's goodness, that this is what God did in my life, and my son and my daughter, this is what God can do for you. And you may say, I don't have the energy to go around the world, or I'm not going to go and preach an evangelistic series, but you do have a testimony to tell. Generally, 13-year-olds don't have the testimonies that 80-year-olds have of God's goodness and God's mercy and God's faithfulness and how God has provided through them through the highs and lows of life, how he got you through a cancer diagnosis or healed your marriage, whatever the case may be. And so we see in this story that, that having God-fearing elderly people in the family is a blessing. Don't, miss, don't underestimate your influence on the next generation. The world may, be, may celebrate youth, but only those with gray hairs have experience, real life experience. And the next generation needs to hear it. And Caleb, he takes the city and he marries his cousin, Aksa, very common in those days. And she says to him, well, it's all very well I've got this land, but it's desert. She says, so ask for this other land where the wells are. And so he gets the wells, Upper Goloth and Lower Goloth. You can still see those wells today. There's three groups of them. There are 14 springs in total. If you ever go to the Holy Land today, you can go and see these wells these 14 springs that still exist to this day. And so here we have a young man called Othniel who comes from a God-fearing family, a family that knows that you can trust God's promises and you can act upon God's promises and God's promises do come true when you act upon them. And he's been raised in a tradition of faith and he must have wondered, well, what am I going to do? Because Caleb, his, he had his hour of glory when he was one of the 12 spies. And when he entered the promised land, he led, he led the conquest of modern-day Hebron. But what am I going to do in my generation? Well, the fact of the matter is, in every generation, God needs people to stand up for him. And young people today, in your generation, God asks you to stand up as well. Old people stand up in your generation, and young people, you stand up in your generation. My grandfather was a preacher for many years, and he preached all through the Blitz of London when the Nazi bombs were falling down in the 19, early 1940s. And his most, most, uh, most powerful sermon was on Daniel 2. And he used to preach that Daniel 2 says the nations of Europe will never be united again. You're familiar with that, yes? The toes of iron and clay. The nations will never unite again. And his basic point was this. Hitler has conquered Europe. If he conquers Britain, it means that Daniel 2 is not true. Therefore, Hitler will not win the Battle of Britain, prophetically, because otherwise Daniel 2 would be wrong. That was a sermon he preached back in the 1940s when the bombs were falling, a more difficult time than we live in today here in Chicago. But in every generation, young and old, God has a time and a place for people to speak up and be his ambassadors. So then we come to what he actually did. And we come to Judges chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 7. Judges chapter 3, we're going to pick it up at verse 7. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, it's a sad story. Because when Joshua died, the people of Israel followed God while Joshua was alive. And then while the elders who came in with Joshua into the promised land, such as Caleb, well, they were alive, the people of Israel were true to God. But when that older generation died, the next generation wanted nothing to do with God, and they followed the gods of Canaan. It was a sensual religion. It was a religion of free sexual expression without moral restraint, and the next generation couldn't get enough of it. Very much, you might say, like parts of our country today. And so it says in verse 7, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. You know, the, the Asherahs, um, it's a female god, is, is often associated with sexual orgies. And they would get plant these groves of trees. They go and have their, sac their, their um, sacrifices. Then they would engage in gross immorality. It was a very sensual religion. 
and says, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishatayim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishatayim for eight years. I want to say thank you to our sister who read those, those names very beautifully. Um, when I was growing up, I always wanted to know, what am I supposed to read for scripture reading? Because they sometimes get really tricky names in there, and she did a great job. So thank you so much for reading those names so beautifully for us. So what happens here? Well, the first thing to notice is Othniel has a name, Othniel, and the name means the power of God. It's a great name, yes? It's not just you know, a common name. His, his name is a message from his parents. When you name your children, think about the name you give them, because children often grow into the name that you give them. If you give your child a name, let's say my, my boy is called David, and he says, Dad, why do you call me David? I said, because David was a man after God's own heart, and you need to know for the rest of your life that God wants you to be a man after his own heart as well. Think about how you name your children, because it's a living message that goes with them for the rest of their lives. Even if they change their name, they'll always remember the original name. It's with you forevermore. And so here we have a young man whose name means the power of God. And the people of Israel turn their back on God and they fall into the hands of a foreign king whose name has an interesting meaning. Kushan, as far as we know, just means Kushan. doesn't mean anything particular. But um, uh, Rishatayim, Rishatayim means double wickedness or double oppression. So when they turn their back on God, seeking the freedom that Canaan would offer, they actually find themselves living under oppression. In this case, it's literal military oppression. But when people turn their backs on God, seeking the freedom to live as they wish, they often find themselves under other forms of oppression. Alcoholism, opioid addiction, drug addiction, various kinds of abuse. When people seek freedom in this world, they often find themselves living under profound forms of oppression. And so they turn their back on God, and they're oppressed by the king of, of, of double wickedness, and uh, he is the king of Mesopotamia. And the word Aram, uh, Ar- he's, from the, he's from Aram, it means exalted or doubly exalted. Mesopotamia, some versions say Aram. It's from the king of exaltation and pride. So when God's people say to God, we no longer want you on the throne of our hearts, we enthrone ourselves on our own hearts. And we find that we start worshipping ourselves rather than God. And pride and self-exaltation are the inevitable consequence. So just as God's people suffered a profound oppression at the hands of a a king of wickedness, whose real name was was, was pride and self-exaltation, so people today, when they turn their back on God, and they say, I'm going to lead my life the way I want to live my life, I'm going to be the king of my own life, they find themselves living under the oppression of sin in all of its manifestations. Not a lot has changed. We have in our nation an opioid addiction crisis, do we not? We have addictions to all kinds of issues. We're a free people, really. Half of America, it seems to me, is addicted to some substance or another. Whether it's what you watch online, or it's what you snort, or whether it's what you eat or drink, we live in a nation of mass addiction. We call ourselves a land of the free. We're slaves. We are slaves to our fallen desires. And once we indulge those fallen desires, they actually master us, and we we become their slaves. And this is what happened to ancient Israel. They become slaves, they're oppressed by a king who represents pride and self-exaltation. And so, what does Othniel do? We find it in verse 10, if you can put that up on the slide, brother, I'd really appreciate that. What does God do through Othniel? Well, there are three stages of Othniel's ministry, and um, let's see, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and he went out to war. This is a three-stage process. The first thing that happens is Othniel, he doesn't go out to war at first, does he? The first thing he does is the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. See, we live in a world where something happens at 12 o'clock, and by 12.01, people are giving their outraged responses on Twitter or social media. We don't gather the facts. We don't wait for the dust to settle. We just respond in the heat of the moment, in anger generally, and, and so social media acts as, as, a, as an accelerant for rage in our nation today. People don't stop and think and wait and let the facts become clear. But this young man, who's, whose name means the Spirit of God, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That is, he waited for God to show him what to do. He waited for God to open a door for him. He waited for him to reveal what his task was in that moment. 
And we may say, oh, well, he had it easy. You know, uh, his world wasn't falling apart. Well, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 46, and you see there a very, very famous passage about waiting for God to reveal to you his will. In Psalm 46, we see there a description of a world that is falling apart. Psalm 46 and verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. I think we say in the world today, fear is the dominant emotion. Even though the earth be removed, so the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Does that sound like the world today? Now, the world is not geographically falling apart, islands not sinking into the sea, but politically and economically and socially and environmentally, our world is falling apart in front of our very eyes. And the psalmist says, but God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be like the nations around. We will not have fear as the dominant emotion in our hearts because God is with us. If you come down in that passage there to verse 7, why? Why are our hearts not overwhelmed with fear? The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. And then verse 10, a verse that really applies to us today, a very, very famous passage. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The psalmist can say that when your nation, when your world, when your country is falling to pieces in front of your eyes, your first response is not to rush to Twitter or, or social media and express your outrage. It is to be still and know that God is still in control, that he is on his throne, that he is moving history to a climax, and the climax of that is the coming of Jesus when all nations, including our own, will be wiped away, and an everlasting kingdom of righteousness and justice will be established only at the coming of Jesus, not, in our, not within our own nation. And so we can be still in the time of crisis, and we can know that God is God. He, is, he will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted on the earth. How will he be exalted? He will be exalted through the actions of his children, those who bear his name on planet earth. How will people know there is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of tenderness, a God of compassion, a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness? How will our world know unless his children manifest those fruit of the Spirit? And so as our nation falls apart before our very eyes and it grieves our hearts, we are called to represent the everlasting kingdom to that dying nation. And we are called to say that there is a kingdom that will never pass away. And our primary loyalty is to that kingdom. As the apostle Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven above from where we are expecting our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come back to Judges chapter three. The first thing Othniel did was he did not spring rashly into action, but he acted only as God directed him. The second thing that he does in verse 10, Judges 3 and verse 10, it says he judged Israel. See, before he goes out to war, he sets things right at home. Now, um, you know, whenever I want to invite someone home, my wife says she's always very happy for that, but she says, just give me like, like 10 minutes notice. Before you walk through the door with somebody, I just need to make sure that the house is ready. Now, is anybody else like that? Yes? My wife is happy for anybody to come to the house, but don't just walk in the door with 10 people unannounced. You know, that's not going to work. You know, there's going to be words spoken afterwards, yes? Yes, there's going to be some shaping of your character, my dear husband, if you ever try and do that again. So the f what we understand in life is before you fight your battles out there, fight your battles inside. Make sure you're clean at home. Make sure that your life is clean and in harmony with God's word. Jesus has a word about this. He says, why do you worry about the speck in somebody else's eye when there's a log in your own eye? And before we start criticizing or pointing fingers, that the, our, re, our responsibility as Christians is to make sure that we in our hearts and our lives, our homes and, and our families, we are right with God. That we're not obviously straying from the word of God. That our lives are in harmony with the will of God before we start doing anything out there. We're called to put our own houses in order. Um, Othniel, he waited until God came upon him, the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God comes upon him, it means that his, his character would have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and self-control. And then he judged the land of Israel. He put things right among God's own people. And it's only then that he goes out to war. And when he goes out to war, it is God who gives him the victory. It is not Othniel. It is God who gains the victory for his people so that God might be glorified.
Not that Othniel might be glorified. Othniel is not a man who seeks his own glory. He acts in the power of the Holy Spirit and God receives the glory through his ministry. And we need to be careful about this as well. When, when we engage in ministry, when we preach, we're Sabbath school teachers, whatever the case may be, do we promote ourselves or do, do we promote God? Do people hear about the Lamb of God and the sin-bearing Savior and what we say and how we live our lives? Or do they hear about how cool and how wonderful and how smart we are? What do people know when they've spoken with us? You know, I, I, I chat about this with my wife sometimes and and she, you know, she basically dresses me. I'm very grateful for that because otherwise I'd be in like te- jeans and t-shirt every day. As an amen from down here, yes. So my wife dresses me and she says, how would you like me to dress you? I said, well, I want to be dressed in a way that nobody remembers what I was wearing. It's a good general rule. I want to be dressed in a way that nobody has any idea what I was wearing. Now that's not how I am when she wears a dress, all right? I'm supposed to notice it. But I want to be dressed in a way that nobody ever knows 10 minutes later what I was wearing. I want people to remember me for what I said or for my character. Amen. And again, I, can't, I have no idea how I got onto this in this sermon here. Okay, I'm kind of going off, off, off the trams here. But um, yes, Othniel does not want to be remembered for his deeds. It is God who is glorified in Othniel's victory. He acts as the Holy Spirit leads, but to God, to God be the glory. And we need to ask ourselves, in our lives today in Chicago, are we acting for the glory of God? Are we acting that God's name be glorified among the Gentiles? Are we acting that people might know that there is a God and there is a coming Savior? When people speak with us, do they remember the anger in our voice or the purity of our speech? When people read our comments on social media, what is their takeaway about our character? that we're just as caught up as everybody else in blind rage, or that there is a coming king. And one day all wrongs will be righted, and there will be justice one day, and there will be peace one day, but not in this world. What do people see in our lives? When Othniel went out to fight, God received the glory. As we live our lives here in Chicago, may God receive the glory. And it's not for us to glorify ourselves. May God be glorified in how we live our lives. So here is a man who gives us a three-part process to living in a world that is falling apart. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to guide you. Secondly, make sure things are right between you and God and within your family and with God. And only then are you in a position to go out and deal with things out there. And I'm sure that if we're honest with ourselves, most of us are still stuck at stage one. Maybe we've got to stage two. But as we allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us, so our witness shines to the world around us. So we see in this story here that God's people, they received all the blessings of God. They lived in a land of plenty, as do we in the United States of America. They were living in a land running with with milk and honey, as we now live in a land of tofu and soy milk. They'd inherited land, homes they'd not built. They drank from wells they'd not dug. We drink from pipes most of us never put in ourselves. We live in a land of incredible infrastructure that enables human flourishing, maybe the most advanced in human history, And yet we live in a land that it's turning its back on God in multiple ways, from all angles. And in a land that is turning its back on God, so this land experiences the oppression of double wickedness, as did the Israelites. And our nation is struggling under multiple addictions and forms of oppression today because it is a nation that is and has and will continue to do to turn its back upon God. And we have to choose how we're going to live. We either follow the ways of America the ways of a nation that I think most of us love, but we recognize that America will one day pass away and it will be replaced by an everlasting kingdom. So for whose kingdom are we going to live in this coming week? Whose values are we going to uphold? Are we going to follow, be guided by Twitter? Is your sense of morality guided by social media? If Twitter is upset, are you upset? Or if the word of God says something's right or wrong, does that guide your morals and your principles in your decision making? We have to make a decision. What's going to guide our lives? What's going to shape us? We have people today who spend hours every day on social media and they wonder why they can't sleep at night because they're so uptight about what's happening in our world. If you just spent 10 minutes in the word of God, it would calm you down because one of the fruit of the spirit is inner peace. So choose how you're going to live in this coming week. Are you going to live for the coming king and the coming kingdom and magnify and exemplify his values? Or are we going to live by the values of a dying nation where so many are suffering, where rage is out of control and where really 
really no good is going to come of the current mess. Who are you going to live for? What are you going to live by? What values are you going to uphold? The choice is yours. But let me say this. You can be like Othniel, because Othniel changed the direction of his nation for 40 years. You can change the direction of your family. The blessings to the faithful go to a thousand generations for those that love him. That's the promise in Exodus 34. You can change your family's spiritual experience by being faithful today in your generation. You can change their walk with God. You can leave um, milestones of God's grace and God's providence that your family can look back at and say, yes, this is how God came through for us. This is where I stood tall for God. Nobody remembers the thousands that bowed to the golden image, but they only remember the names of the three boys that stood tall, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So be like Othniel. Ask God and his Holy Spirit to fill you today, to shape you and to change you, to take away the works of the flesh, which is what we see on the streets of America, and replace it with the fruit of the Spirit. Go home today and ask God, how do I need to put my home in order? Is there something I need to change? Do I have an anger problem? Do I have a secret addiction? Do I have a cherished sin? Do I have an ancient um, bigotry or hatred in my heart? Please, God, change my heart today. See if there be any wicked way of me and create in me a right spirit, Heavenly Father. I don't know it for myself, so you search me and you see if there be any wicked way in me because only you know truly what is right and wrong. And the ways of every heart are deceitful, but only you, God, know what is wrong in my heart. Change me today. Show me how my family can grow closer to you. And in this coming week, give me an opportunity to be, as we are all called to be, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That when people meet us, they have a, they have a manifestation of the presence of Jesus Christ. That is my charge to you. That is my challenge to you today. And by the power of God, Othniel, may our homes and our families and our church be a living witness to the coming King. May God bless you in this coming week as we stand tall for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us all express our desire, not desire, uh, in a hymn number 618, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
So our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Indeed, Father, we long for that day that we will reign with Christ eternally. Father, our eyes are focused on that city whose architect and builder is not man, but it is God. Father, we are but pilgrims in this violent and broken world. And Father, as we journey through this coming week, wherever we live, Illinois or any other state of our nation, I pray that we will keep our eyes fixed on the author and finisher and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. And our prayer, Father, is that people will see Jesus in us. So Father, shape us, change us, fill us with your spirit. May we not be infected by the fear or the rage of our nation, but may we manifest hope and joy and peace, for this is the fruit of your presence in our lives. Thank you, Father, for taking away our fear. Thank you for taking away our grieving, our upset. Thank you for taking away our rage and our bitterness and our anger. And thank you for replacing it today with the fruit of your spirit. Perform that heart surgery in each one of us today, Father, that we may truly represent Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.